Total War Force and Lennon's Power Source. I am, as always, your host, Christopher Paul Dugdale, MEDMA. We are Duncanville High School in these United States, and today is March 2nd, 2021. And on this date in history, in 1836, so 185 years ago, uh, the Texas independent, the Texas Texas independence movement, or Texas declared its independence. I can probably make that last even longer. What I just said, it was in the middle of the Alamo, and uh, well, anyway, everyone still died in the Alamo and Goliad. Kind of a downer. Okay, so going into. Uh, the war, they tried a much different type of policy. And they moved to a policy of total war. And this is getting rid of laissez-faire where the government doesn't interfere with uh, with business and what's being produced to, uh, well, one where the government controls everything. More objects were dropped during Verdun than in all the previous warfare combined. To show you just kind of the change in, in the structure of everything. Uh, the German uh, war minister, Walter Rathenau, helped to deal with shortages in Germany. 38% uh, of the workers in Krupp armaments were women. Uh, Krupp will make one of the largest guns ever made, and it delivers a payload so large that it made a hole almost the size of an acre uh, that was about 30 feet deep. Uh, David Lloyd of uh, Britain, he dealt with the shortage of shells in the uh, British Army. Uh, these would be uh, shells for ammunition, not for seashells. Uh, that was also a horrible shortage due to, uh, well, everything in the seas. The fish got it the worst. Sorry, I don't know why I went off on a tangent there. Uh, so the government raises taxes to help provide more uh, shells. Uh, they also depreciate the currency and made more money, and they borrowed a lot of money to pay for the war. The war cost over $350 billion and nearly bankrupted uh, Great Britain. Had the United States not gotten involved whenever it did, had the war lasted another two years, Britain would have been almost completely bankrupt and would have lost the war. Uh, France was only a couple months away itself, so. So, uh, Germany helped some of the unhappy people try and get their independence. Uh, they helped the Irish uh, Republican Brotherhood seize the government buildings in Dublin in 1916 for independence. Uh, this started in the post office whenever uh, Michael Collins will initiate the uh, fight for Irish independence. Uh, the fight does not last long and uh, the leaders were later executed. Uh, Allied forces tried to encourage uh, Polish and Czechoslovakian groups in Austria-Hungary to get their independence. Uh, T.E. Lawrence, uh, also known as Lawrence of Arabia, leads a revolt in Saudi Arabia to try and get independence in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, this took place over two years. Uh, Ottoman forces were crushed by Australian, Indian, and New Zealand forces. So, all's fair in love and war. Let's include breakups in that. Uh, so German generals uh, Eric uh, Ludendorff and Paul von Hindenburg, uh, they really ran everything that was going on in Germany behind the scenes. A lot of people thought that it was uh, the, the Kaiser uh, Wilhelm II, but he was more of a figurehead throughout the war. These two guys ran everything and whenever they run off, uh, when they run off Wilhelm II, you know, it just makes it that much easier to, uh, for a guy like Hitler to work his way up the ranks. Not that that was the goal of the French or the British or the Americans, but it's what ended up happening. Uh, so in Germany, they were doing rationing as well, but it was based on calories. So you would only get so many calories a day, and they got to the point where they were weighing people to try and figure out how much food they needed for a week. Uh, so France was uh, in a lot of trouble because when the Germans moved in their forces, they took over a lot of their uh, steel production and coal production. 
So 80% of the steel and 75% of the coal uh, that was produced in the past by France uh, disappeared during the war. Uh, Russia was a lot more progressive whenever it comes to women's rights, but in, in a way that wasn't as nice as that might sound. They formed the Women's Battalion of Death, and they saw action on the front. Uh, some of the best uh, snipers in the world were Russian women. Not yet. Yeah. So, to help with the war effort, Britain employed women to make uh, TNT, which, in case you don't know, is dynamite, and uh, and shells that were fired out uh, full of explosives or, in some cases, poisonous gas. Now, the lack of safety condition in a lot of these factories leads to the sterilization and poisoning of thousands and thousands of women. However, they did not know this when this was going on. Now, the Defense of the Realm Act, this is passed by the British Parliament. This let the British government control citizens' lives, uh, censor and control the press, requisition supplies from private citizens, so if you had a large supply of tin or steel or anything that could be used for warfare, then the government could, could take it. Now, the goal was eventually to uh, compensate you for that, but at the time, they took what they needed to survive as a nation. The United States did not want anything to do with the war. Uh, Wilson didn't. Uh, the Americans were split anyway. Half of the Americans, or well, a large percentage of the Americans were pro-British because they did a lot of trading with the British. Uh, they were of British descent. Uh, but then the uh, German, the German Im immigrant population, well, which had been there for over a hundred years and had multiplied over ten million people, did not want to fight Germany, and the Irish uh, immigrant population did not want to fight to help Britain. So there was a big problem with that. The British used propaganda or influence Im Im information to influence opinion to get U.S. support. So they wrote about all types of exaggerated German atrocities in Belgium. Uh, they controlled every story that went over because they cut the uh, they cut the telegraph lines between uh, Germany and the rest of the world, and they put a blockade. So really, no news was getting directly here from Germany. Uh, the British censored their newspapers throughout the war, and France cut out a lot of civil liberties and basic civil rights. Uh, starting in 1917. Uh, Americans did have a vested interest because we had a lot more money invested in Britain than we did in Germany. And from an economic standpoint, we had more of an interest in seeing Germany not do as well, so we had less competition on the market for our industrial goods. So, the Russian Revolution. Uh, Russia had kind of been at the uh, at the peak of uh, frustration. Uh, they were still about 300 years behind the rest of the world. Uh, they did have a train now, but uh, you had to take different trains to different areas because they did not have standardized railroad track. Uh, it was very ec economically backward, and uh, when Alexander II's reforms are undone by his son, and furthermore, by uh, by uh, Nicholas II, uh, they did try to fix some things, like uh, Finance Minister uh, uh, Sergei Witt uh, industrialized the country, started to industrialize them, but the same problems that they had in the rest of Europe they had in, uh, in Russia at the time. And this leads to overcrowding, massive pollution, uh, horrible working conditions. Uh, in the United States in 1904, there were 600,000 or 700,000 people injured on the job, and over 40,000 people died. Uh, and to make matters worse, thousands of Russian officials were killed from 1870 to 1914. Uh, so they were ready for something horrible to happen. So the revolution of 1905. So Russia and uh, Japan uh, fought in a war, and whenever they lost, 
there were more problems because there was a lack of uh, food and a lack of supplies. So a bunch of peaceful protesters marched to the Tsar's Winter Palace, and Nicholas II uh, had them killed by uh, his palace guards. They killed hundreds and hundreds of people. And uh, Nicholas II was forced to form a parliament or Duma to... Uh, well, to share power and, and keep out a revolution of the people. Now, Nicholas II believes in the divine right of kings. He thought that everything he did was good, it was ordained of God, so it didn't matter. It didn't matter what he did because he could make no mistakes because of this uh, symbiotic relationship between him and God. Uh, Minister Peter uh, Stolpen he tries to create reforms to make uh, Russia a parliamentary democracy, much like uh, England did. Uh, he was going to allow peasants to sell their land, and he wanted to strengthen the zemstvos, or government councils. But he was assassinated, and it was really the last straw for Russia. So there was an attempt to try and save things, but it was not going to happen. So let's look at the Romanov family for just a moment. Uh, Nicholas II had five children. He had four daughters and one son. Uh, he, he spent most of his time, though, with a uh, specialized military unit. And uh, they were well trained and they were up to European standards. But there was only about 250 men in this unit. Millions of other Russian officers would not even have guns in many cases. Uh, so Alexandra ran things while Nicholas was playing with the soldiers. Now, uh, she had a lot of problems because while her daughters were healthy, the son and heir to the throne, Alexei, was a hemophiliac, which meant that his uh, blood didn't clot. So she goes and tries to find all the greatest doctors in the world to come in to treat her son so he doesn't die of, you know, a shaving, shaving accident whenever he's older or you know, a small nick, and he, he bleeds out. None of the doctors could do anything, but uh, there was this holy man who she was so desperate she allowed in. Uh, his name was Rasputin uh, Grigorovich. And uh, Rasputin, whenever I say holy man, he, did not, he was not associated with the church, but he was almost more of a witch doctor. And uh, Rasputin goes in to her son, who had just cut himself, and these cuts were severe all of them because his blood didn't clot he could bleed out with the uh, smallest of cuts but Rasputin was able to calm Alexei down and get him to stop bleeding to the point where his blood could clot uh, he did this through hypnosis now many people have the view of hypnosis as kind of a parlor game that you might see in uh, in a Vegas act but the truth is just by getting someone to calm down to slow their breathing it actually made your heart pump a little bit slower and then blood flow wasn't as bad and it was made much worse by the fact that Alexei knew that any time he was cut he could bleed to death so Alexandra keeps him around all the time uh, Rasputin because you know he can save her son and he takes advantage of this uh, in the Kremlin and basically goes around and has an affair with every, every willing and maybe sometimes not willing body in the Kremlin basically knocking on the door and male, female, you know, elderly or, you know, a minor he, he slept with. Uh, a lot of people are really upset with this. And the economy's falling apart, the government's falling apart, the war's going horribly, they don't have supplies for all their men, and uh, the decision was made to assassinate Rasputin. So the men put enough poison in his uh, drink that night to kill an elephant. And whenever they went to retrieve the body, he was still alive. In fact, he was waking up thinking, wow, what kind of party is this going to be? I'm excited. And uh, the men panic and one of them fires a gun, shoots him in the left side of the chest. This would kill most people, but 
Rasputin was one of the 0.01% of the population whose heart was on the right side. He gets a little bit upset and miffed, but they gag him and they drag him outside. They th put a noose around his neck, put him on a horse, slap the horse. The horse takes off, he falls off the back, and instead of it snapping and breaking his neck, it broke the branch. Uh, in their fury, they go to the river. They chip open the, uh, the Volga River, which was several inches thick. It, this is in December of 1916. With his, with his head still in the noose and the branch still attached, they forced him into the water. After 10 minutes, they decided to bring his body up, bury him in an unmarked grave, and then run off. But when they pulled him out of the water, he coughed up the water and was still alive. It was at that point they took the next logical step and cut off his head. He was dead this time took five different attempts to do it but they kill him so the country's falling into complete ruin and Rasputin's dead starvation is throughout the nation the money is worth nothing in the country uh, it said that if you had if you had a wheelbarrow full of money that you w wouldn't have enough money to buy a loaf of bread and People were flocking in from the uh, from the country uh, because they were being ransacked by the German army that was approaching. Everything's going horribly. So, let's see what happens. Conditions got much worse in uh, Russia following the assassination of uh, Rasputin. So, a lot of women in in Moscow marched on the palace in a food riot on what's known as International Women's Day. Uh, when palace guards refused to fire on, on these women that were approaching, the Tsar was forced to ab abdicate or step down. Uh, Nicholas II and his family thought it was just going to be a temporary thing where they would be put back on, on the uh, throne at a later date, uh, but things wouldn't go quite that way for them. Uh, now, the Duma was now was, was going to rule the country. This was the Russian parliament. And they were led by a Menshevik by the name of Alexander Kerensky. Uh, Menshevik was one of the major factions in the country. You had the Mensheviks and the uh, Bolsheviks. As a leader of the provisional government, government Alexander Kerensky uh, freed all the political prisoners to try and show that, the, uh, that this government was going to be different. But he had a major problem... Uh, because of opposition from the Petrograd Soviet. Now, uh, all these political prisoners coming back, there were a lot of troublemakers in this group. Uh, there was a priest, uh, an Orthodox priest, uh, who was going through his training, uh, who was deemed a bit too radical. They sent him to Siberia. Uh, while he was in jail, he changed his last name to represent the uh, steel bars in his cell. That man's name became Joseph Stalin who would later become the second largest mass murderer in the history of mankind. Uh, Vladimir Lenin and uh, Leon Trotsky also were coming back. They were in... Uh, they were in... Uh, in Germany at the time. And they both approached the Kaiser and said, Hey, if you give us money to go to Russia, we'll overthrow the government, end the war in your favor, and we'll, uh, we'll change the government. And the Kaiser thought, you know what, these guys are probably going to fail, but if they do, that's good for me. If not, it causes some chaos against someone I'm fighting against. So Vladimir Lenin uh, was, uh, he became radical because his brother was assassinated, not for carrying out the assassination of, of the Tsar, but for knowing that someone else was going to attempt to assassinate the Tsar. So at this point he becomes radical. He uh, starts to follow this policy of Marxism or communism. Uh, he harasses Karl Marx, the uh, person who created the concept of Marxism, until Marx told him, yeah, I'm talking about Russia. Although Marx is really talking about the perfect place for communism would be Germany. Who knows if that would have been true. 
Uh, and the April thesis uh, is where uh, Lenin applies Marxism to Russia. And he thought that imperialism would show the dangers of capitalism. And he also believed in something called the Vanguard Party, that only small political groups could operate in Russia. Because Russia is such a vast territory, anything more than that would make it much more difficult to try and, and put together. And that if you went in with a different system for modernizing Russia, it'd be successful. He called this telescoping, where you focus on one industry at a time, and that way you can put everything you need in place to create all the other industries. He thought it would be much better under a proletarian uh, dictatorship, a proletarian meaning of the uh, workers or of the people. Then, to uh, start his revolution, he just used simple slogans that all the people could get behind, which were peace, bread, and land, all things that people wanted, and also cried out for all power to the Soviets. So, in a very short period of time, he built a massive group of support. In what's known as the October Revolution, Vladimir Lenin and Leon Trotsky took over Russia with the Red Army. Uh, his followers, the Bolsheviks, would eventually be named, renamed the Communist Party. They were fighting against the Mensheviks and the White Army. So when we talk later on about the Red Scare, the Red Scare is a result of the Bolsheviks being the Red Army, and well, that's, that's why you have the Red Scare. Or that's not why you have the Red Scare, but that's why it's called the Red Scare. Uh, they... Uh, they let the workers seize control of all their factories. Uh, they let the, uh, the land be seized by the uh, peasants. And this begins a civil war. Which they would win rather quickly. Upon seizing power, Lenin would negotiate a treaty with Germany. This would be the first time in history, really, that Russia's been defeated in a war and mainly it was because they were in the midst of a civil war. And so uh, Russia is going to give up land to Germany to peacefully leave World War I. Uh, if you're looking for comparisons, uh, this is very similar to what happened when uh, Francisco Pizarro invaded the Inca Empire and captured, uh, and captured Cusco during a civil war. And so that worked there, and that also worked during this time. If you can invade a country during a civil war, it's a little bit easier to take them out. Now, just to wrap up this storyline right here, uh, the Reds are going to kill the Tsar and his family. And that's all of his family, including uh, his infamous daughter, Anastasia. They were all killed in the basement of their... Uh, their hunting palace. Uh, their bodies were taken out and burned. Then they were uh, buried in one grave for the men, one grave for the women, and their bodies were covered with acid to try and remove any traces of who they were. And they went largely unfound for the next 95 years. And it wasn't until the last five or 10 years that they started finding the bodies of the Romanovs. Uh, the Civil War was over by 1921 and uh, the land and economy were destroyed, but the new nation was called the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or the Soviet Union. Now, a little bit more about this uh, Russian Civil War. Uh, Leon Trotsky led the Red Army, and uh, the Red Army was outnumbered against the White Army and the Bolsheviks. Uh, but they got together a group of uh, Tsarist supporters and socialist revolutionaries. They didn't tell everyone that they were planning on killing the Tsar and his family, but there were people that thought that they had a chance to bring everything back. Uh, so Trotsky let the workers run the factories, which is what a lot of the workers wanted. And even though it wasn't working, most of them were happy. And anyone who hoarded any crops or livestock were severely punished. And so these type of things together built a class warfare between the wealthy peasants and the landless laborers. 
uh, which is one of the predictions from the uh, well from Karl Marx's studies. Now, the Red Terror. The Bolsheviks won quickly because of the horribly brutal tactics that they were willing to use. They also had a secret police or Cheka. They shot, they shot and executed thousands and thousands without a trial. Uh, in fact, anyone that was part of that, they would also round up their families and do the same thing to them. And not just their immediate family, extended families. Uh, then once they took control, the next thing they did is they rounded up two million people who were he heavy supporters of the old regime. And they learned this from the French Revolution because when those people were left behind, eventually they would start another revolution and overthrow them. So the idea was to keep whittling the population down. Anyone who had anything to do with power before was wiped out. Anyone who looked like they were starting to put together a group to challenge for power was completely wiped out. And whenever completely wiped out, all extended family. The idea was if anyone would rebel in your family that you would stop them so that you wouldn't be wiped out. Uh, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics is what replaces Russia. And not only is it Russia proper, but they start going around seizing several nations around them. And uh, this forms a new empire. Now only 50% of the people were uh, ethnic Russians. So you had a lot of different types of people and this is going to be a common problem later on. So, uh, the party state structure. There was only one political party in Russia at this point, the CPSU or the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. And this is led by the Politburo or Policy Bureau. And whoever was in charge of the Politburo was the leader of the Soviet Union. Uh, they also had the title of Premier. Uh, Stalin made the, uh, he, he became the General Secretary. And so he manages the nation uh, while Lenin's running things. And during this time period, he will appoint thousands and thousands of people that are loyal to him to positions under him. And this will work out really well for him whenever he makes a push for power later on. Uh, as far as nationalities, there were 50 different ethnic groups that were part of the Soviet Union when it was created. And they were all controlled by the general secretary and everyone that was put in a position was loyal to Stalin and if they were seen to not be loyal then they were taken out with quite a bit of brutality. The new economic policy or the NEP. This is a change from communism. This allowed peasants to sell their grain merchants, uh, could sell goods for profits, and this formed a middle class called uh, the Kulaks. By the way, this will not be a good thing for a long period of time because eventually that middle class is going to be wiped out. Uh, the new economic policy is not something that really fits with uh, Marxism or communism. And so after a short period of time, you'll see this disappear. Uh, Alexandra uh, Kolontai was... Uh, the People's Commissar for Social Welfare, and she founded something called the uh, Zentnodel, and this fought illiteracy among women, and also tried to educate women about new marriage laws. Uh, you'll find that uh, Marxism or communism gives a lot more rights to women than just about any other type of government did at this time. Now the Commissar, this is going to promote the uh, the CPSU, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, for children. So this starts to indoctrinate them at a young age. This is really no different than what happens in the United States by teaching about American uh, American history and trying to promote uh, trying to promote patriotism. Uh, Sergei Eisenstein uh, makes a, a movie about the revolution to try and convince people about how great it is 
And this movie was called uh, Potemkin. I've never seen it, so I don't know how good it is. You know, if you guys get really bored in May, we can watch this together as a class. Although, I'm sure that uh, we won't be all together in person. Not because of the plague or anything like that, but, you know, it happens. Well, anyway, uh, so... Lennon dies. Lennon's shot in the head. He survives it, and he's okay afterwards, but he ends up dying from a stroke about six to eight months later. Uh, has a lot of strokes. It appears that being shot in the head is not good for you. So, Stalin and Trotsky were the two biggest uh, well, people that could lead the country, uh, mainly just because of the power that they had. Uh, Trotsky attacks NEP and calls for revolution. And he didn't like the bureaucratization of uh, communism in the country. He thought that all you're doing was forming a new upper class uh, that the lower classes would be in opposition to. Uh, but Stalin controlled the CPSU, and again, he'd been putting people into position that supported him the entire time. So Trotsky never really had a chance. He gets exiled. Uh, he moves to Mexico City, and eventually he will uh, meet up and hang out with uh, Frida Calderon and uh, Diego Rivera, and eventually he'll be assassinated uh, on the streets by a Soviet assassin. This brings the end of our story today. I hope everyone's having a great day. I look forward to seeing you soon. In the meantime, uh, just remember one more unit before we have our test. This is Chris Dugdell, and I'll see you on the other side.